Hey there! Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Hey everyone, Ray here with a brand new book recommendation. John Glenn was a Marine Corps officer with 59 World War II combat missions under his belt. His wingman was Ted Williams, two-time American League Triple Crown winner who, at the pinnacle of his career, was inexplicably recalled to active service. Over the next half century, these two men would become household names, the affable astronaut and the notoriously tempestuous left fielder. Their enduring friendship, forged in battle, would see them through exhilarating highs and devastating lows. Through unpublished letters, unit diaries, declassified military records, manuscripts, and new and illuminating interviews, the wingmen, the unlikely, unusual, unbreakable friendship between John Glenn and Ted Williams by Adam Lazarus is an inspiring, epic, and intimate portrait of two American legends, larger than life and extraordinarily human. The Wingmen by Adam Lazarus is available everywhere books are sold. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 459, The Siege of Odessa Begins. Last time, the defense of the southwestern and southern fronts had all but collapsed. To be sure the invaders hardly had an easy time of it, there was certainly no freedom of movement until there was, when the Stavka ordered a pullback across the Dnieper River. And the Germans, with their Romanian allies, would take advantage of this just as soon as they dealt with Odessa on the Black Sea coast and Kiev, which actually sat on the Dnieper. But the German Sixth Army was currently laying siege to this distressed city, the capital of the Ukraine. Of course, now that Uman had fallen and the surviving Soviet troops in between Kiev and Odessa were retreating east, the area between these two stricken cities was, more or less, wide open. And with such a gaping hole that was only getting wider and deeper by the day, Tulunev, the southern front commander, was ordered to pull back, but to leave a garrison at Odessa, as it was still resisting. As for that coastal city, the last thing the Germans needed or wanted was another siege. So there was probably some relief in Berlin and Army Group South headquarters when Marshal Ion Antonescu, the Prime Minister of Romania, volunteered his forces to take on the job of capturing the port city. Further, he promised Romania's King Michael and von Rundstedt that he would clear the Black Sea coast, leaving the Germans to stay on the move. Yet, the Romanians would find out, as the Germans and Italians were finding out, that taking on trapped Soviet troops was no small matter. After all, experience, or desperation, is the best teacher. On August 10th, the same day that the Stavka ordered a pullback to the eastern side of the Dnieper, Army Group South Commander von Rundstedt issued Order No. 5, which had three goals. First, the continuation of the destruction of all enemy forces on this side of the Dnieper, specifically those Soviet troops who had managed to slip out of the Uman pocket. Two, to secure and occupy the west bank of the Dnieper, and that was well on the way to being done, as close to Kiev, the group Schwedler was already there and spreading out. And three, cover the northern flank of the German 6th Army, 
that was currently laying siege to Kiev. It would be going too far to say that von Reichenau and his men had that very area under control. Again, the Soviet Fifth Army would pop out of the marshes for annoying raids, but the Germans knew it was only a matter of time before the Stavka would once again cobble together another desperate force to either attack von Reichenau or make for Kiev itself to beef up the city's defenses, and thus prolonging the stalemate here. But when he needed it most, Tulyulnev received a reprieve of a kind from Hitler. Der Fuhrer could have easily ordered parts of Army Group South to simply put themselves in between the retreating Russians and the Dnieper River. Instead, factoring economics, which sustains an economy on a war footing, he wanted von Kleist's panzers to take three major cities that would give him control of the land just west of the Great Bend in the Dnieper River. Besides which, the area was resource-rich, and soon, slave labor would be harvesting and or excavating foodstuffs and resources back to the Reich. But it's just as well that Berlin did not order another attempted encirclement or massive trap for those retreating Soviet troops. Honestly, the men were tired, their machines needed attention, and they were low on fuel and ammunition. What could have made another Kessel attempt possible was if Army Group South's other allies, the Hungarians or Italian forces, had been closer to the front. But as it was, they were far to the rear, already low on fuel and supplies. So, it would be the Panzers that would take the three main cities of the area. The first was Kremunchek, along the Dnieper River, practically due east of Uman, although about 180 kilometers or 111 miles away, as the crow flies. This task was given to 3rd Panzer Corps. Next was Krivo Rog, about 90 kilometers or 55 miles due south of Kremunchak, and level with the strongest bend of the Dnieper River. Taking this on would be the 14th Panzer Corps. Lastly was Nikoev, modern-day Mukolev, at the southern end of the River Bug. As Nikoev was the most southern of the target cities, and about 90 kilometers or 55 miles to the northeast of Odessa, as the coast goes to the northeast there, this could have the added benefit of trapping any Soviet troops retreating from there once the Romanian siege was successful. The 48th Panzer was tasked with taking the city. Von Kleist's first Panzer Group was a bit spread out and somewhat spent, but orders were orders. The men and their machines moved out. And it would be Nikoev to be the first to fall, which was only the beginning of those locals' torment. The city was founded during the Second Russo-Turkish War of 1787 to 1792. In 1789, Prince Gregory Potemkin established it and named it after St. Nicholas the patron of seafarers, as the city allows access to the Black Sea. Or, more simply, it's where the River Bug and the Black Sea meet. The 48th Panzer dashed towards Nikolev and occupied it on August 16th. To the southeast of Nikolev sits her sister town, Kirshen, a bit closer to the Black Sea, and is located where the Dnieper and the Black Sea touch. Just three days later, so August 19th, the Liebstandarte Adolf Hitler took that town. Being that this was an SS division, and units of the Einsatzgruppe D, led by Otto Ohlendorf, were with the 48th Panzer, the elimination of Jews and communists started on day one. By the time September was over, some 35,782 Soviet citizens had been dealt with. But keeping such detailed records of their deeds... Those very documents would be used against the perpetrators during their Nuremberg trials. As this area in general was coming under access control, the German 22nd Infantry Division took control of a major bridge to the northeast of Curzon. The German 11th Army now had its way further, deeper into Russia. As for the other cities, Kremanchug, located on the Dnieper just before its sharp turn, was taken the following month on September 15th. 
And before the Germans were pushed out in 1943, just over 90% of the city's buildings had been leveled, which leaves Kervor Rog, again located in the center of the almost peninsula-like territory created by the bend in the Dnieper, Kervor Rog fell at the same time as Nikolaev in mid-August. Though founded in 1775, by 1934, Stalin's policies made it the country's largest metallurgical works production city. But now, that belonged to Berlin. And like Kremenchug, by the time the Germans were driven out in 1944, the vast majority of the city's structures had been leveled. And that leaves Odessa. But as the defense of this Black Sea port city delayed Army Group South to such a degree that it would profoundly affect later operations, which affected not only Army Group South as a whole, but also the panzers of Guderian of Army Group Center, well, the siege of Odessa turned out to be that one domino that made so many others fall afterward. Thus, we shall zoom in before the shooting started. In October 1939, with the war just weeks old, Moscow established the Odessa Military District. No, Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany were not at war, but Stalin could see that German troops were now that much closer to Soviet territory, as they had just split between them the now non-existent Poland. And the ace that Odessa had, that Kiev could not, was the added protection of the Black Sea Fleet, stationed at Odessa. And the fleet there was impressive enough. It had a cruiser, a mine layer, a battalion of coastal ships, two battalions of minesweepers, four battalions of patrol boats, the second brigade of torpedo boats, a naval air squadron, three artillery battalions, and an AA regiment. This, of course, does not include any army infantry units. Not that this was as much as Romania could bring to bear. Yet, despite this, the Stavka knew that whatever came at Odessa, should hostilities break out, would be overwhelming. So, the planners focused on defense, not taking the fight to the enemy. Having said that, Sun Tzu claimed many battles and many years ago that to know the enemy is to know victory. Thus, serious men in Soviet uniforms calculated what could potentially come at Odessa, and the math was never good for the defenders. And the air forces of Odessa could not alter this outcome. But first things first. The defenders within the city were hoping for the best for their comrades who were along the Romanian border, namely the four rifle divisions, two cavalry divisions, the 18th Mechanized Corps with two tank divisions and one mechanized division. But as we have seen, though it took a bit longer than desired, all these units would either be wiped out, captured, or forced back. It may seem unforgivable that in early June 1941, that 70% of the southern region's tanks needed a major overhaul, or that only 50% of their AA units actually had guns, light or heavy, or that the number of fighters was still being built up, But, considering the entire length of the border between these two soon-to-be adversaries, Moscow seems due some forgiveness. Some area had to be lacking, and the Stavka had decided it would be the area touching Romania. And then fate stepped in. For the first half of 1941, the Odessa district, as all the others had, carried out field exercises. This included the respective district's air forces. And there was another army field exercise planned for late June 1941. But this would require all the headquarters of the area to come together. Given the lack, or thereof, of communications at the time, someone realized if a German attack came at the moment that the various heads were together and away from their commands— command and control would be minimized, to say the least. So it was decided and approved to raise a detached army command team to put it on combat alert and to then send it in vehicles on June 19, 1941 to the reserve command post at Terraspol. 
Tiraspol is only 100 kilometers or 62 miles from the Romanian border. But at least when and if the invasion came, there would be a command team practically on the border to help with a Soviet response. And fate wasn't done. The district's chief of staff, Major General V. Sakharov, seemed constantly unsatisfied with the status of his defenses. So he put out an order that was to take effect at 11 p.m. on June 21st, just hours before Barbarossa kicked off. Not that he knew this. He ordered that headquarters and troops on combat alert be increased and moved out of populated places. Next, the covering units that would buy time were to take up their areas of responsibility now. Also, communications between headquarters and border guards detachments were to be checked regularly. Lastly, the Air Force commander ordered that the planes were to be dispersed to their operational airfields. Hours later, when the Luftwaffe bombed their assigned targets, starting at 3.30 a.m. June 22nd, they failed to take out as many enemy aircraft as planned for. Also, the Soviet AA units, now at their stations, took out at least 20 Axis planes on that first morning. The Germans had hoped that surprise and overwhelming numbers would bring that number closer to zero. It will come as no surprise that the Odessa and nearby districts lost fewer men on June 22nd than all the others facing the other two German army groups. And those troops would be needed, as Odessa was a frontline city from the first day of the war. In fact, the administration of the city announced on June 26th, just four days in, that the war had reached the city's edge. This greatly pleased the Nazi high command, for they took the message as a plea or a last prayer, for their grand plans for the entire region were about to come true. The German-led forces here would thrust forward and wipe out all Southwest Front forces before them. Then they would turn south and get in behind the Southern Front's forces. After both groups were gutted, the taking of Kiev, the Donbass, and Rostov could begin. And just like that, during the opening phase of Barbarossa, hundreds of thousands of Soviet troops, if not millions, would be dead. The resources of the area would be in German hands, and the Crimea would be open. And yet, before any of that could happen in its entirety, Odessa had to fall, and the outnumbered defenders of Odessa, whether on land, at sea, or in the air, would make the Romanians bleed for supporting Hitler. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So um, we're, we're going to do the Odessa siege, then we'll take Kiev, and then we'll go from there. So I uh, hope you enjoy the story so far. I've only got one donation from since last time, and that is Mr. The One and Only, Mark Porter. Uh, as far as the rest of you, what, you don't like me butchering your name? It's kind of my calling card. Oh, well, maybe I'll get you next time. Take care, everyone.